you're trying to reach that consumer. You're trying to get your products in the stores <laughs> because the retailers, they all come to the show. So you have to be there, really. It's smart for you to be there. It's like the one weekend of the year that you know, open the doors and everybody comes in. We just all have a great time because I believe in cooperation. So we can compete and cooperate. That's what we need to do better at, because we will be a lot further. We can help each other a lot more. Welcome to the Start Right Here podcast. We put the spotlight on BIPOC beauty pros and their paths to success. We share their stories along with actionable tips that you can apply to your career or your life. We invite you to subscribe, rate, or review the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or share it with a friend. Now, let's get to the show. Hi, everybody. I am really excited to bring this show to you today. We are fortunate enough to be in the presence of a natural hair pioneer, Talia Wajid who is not only has been a natural hair stylist, she has developed three lines of products, but most of all, she is the founder and creator of the World Natural Hair Show, which started in the late 90s, way before many of us were thinking about natural hair. We're going to talk to Leah about her career trajectory, but also about how and why she founded the World Natural Hair Show, and what she sees about natural hair in the future. So welcome, Talia. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start with some easy questions because this is a great way to just ice break. What's the first beauty product you remember buying? It was blue grease in a jar. Blue Magic? It was probably Blue Magic or Bergamot or something. Uh Uh-huh. The Posner's was blue too. Probably one of those. Dax. Oh, it's coming back now. Oh, yeah, Dax. Yeah, I remember Dax. Yeah. <laughs> the green one, the blue one, the black one. <laughs> Great. What's the latest product you've tried? I know you're developing products all the time. So We are working on a scalp care regimen now. So that's the product that I'm using now. When we go through the process of creating a new product, I, of course, get to use it and make sure that it's something that the audience would like, my customers would like. And myself, along with other stylists, we do a think tank and we, you know, try the products out. So, yeah, it's our scalp care, sea moss and tea tree. Wow. Yeah, it's really good. (laughs) So what's the beauty advice you live by or leave alone? So the beauty advice I live by is just don't overdo it. Just don't make it complicated. Beauty doesn't have to be complicated. And that's as far as, you know, from your makeup to your hair care to fashion. You just want to be comfortable and feel comfortable with the products you're using and just the routine that it takes to use them as well. Is there a beauty advice you leave alone? Chemicals, anything that is not good for your body, your scalp, your hair. Those are the things that I stay away from and I encourage others to stay away from as well. You can be beautiful without those. (laughs) Okay. We believe you. I want to start with a question I ask all my guests. Do you think the beauty industry was a destination or a detour for you? I think it was a destination. It was a destination from my heart, but society told us at that time that you go to school, you know, get a good job and you're set for life and do all this other creative stuff that you want to do. It's just not going to amount to anything. So you just do these things. I did some of those things. And every time I tried, you know, really try to get into it, it just did not work out. And my heart wasn't there anyway. So I always went back to what I loved. So I would have to say it was definitely a destination with some detours. (laughs) Were you always interested in hair as a child? Oh, my God. Yes. Yes. I played with doll babies till I was about probably 14 just so I could do their hair. I just loved playing in the hair. I used to cut their hair and do all kinds of things, braid it, twist it, shampoo it. Wasting my mom's products on dolls. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I've always had a love for um, doing hair. So what was your first job? My first real job was braiding hair. It's the first time I got paid for doing a job. Yes, I was braiding hair. 
What do you think you learned when you started braiding hair that set you up for all that you do now? I wouldn't say so much braiding hair. I guess the environments that I was in while I was braiding hair. My first braid job away from my so-called teenage business <laughs> was with a lady. Her salon was called Songer. Her name was Barbara Terry. And I worked in her salon. And that's where I learned a lot. You know, I was already a really great braider, a great hairstylist. But I just learned so much from her about technique, about our hair, Black women's hair, the way that our hair grows. The um, weak, I won't say weak, I'm only saying weak, but I'll say the more fragile parts of our hair and how to treat those. And, you know, sometimes you just have to turn customers away. They may want these things, but we're not here to damage people's hair. So healthy hair, I would definitely say is something that I've learned about through doing hair, braiding hair. And she had a lot to do with just teaching me that, teaching me how to appreciate it. You started in New York City. You're born and raised in New York City, like me. Then you made the move to Atlanta. You worked in a salon in New York. You worked in a salon in Atlanta. Were there differences in how people approached natural hair, what people wanted, that kind of thing? Oh, yes. There was a huge difference. I had to leave New York. Yeah, we went through a divorce and bad marriage. And so it was very abrupt. So I just left and got to Atlanta, had my plans. Someone had told me about the salon. So I went there, met the lady. And it's just no one did natural hair there. It was like a strange foreign thing to them. And no one was interested in having it done. (laughs) So I had to fly back and forth to New York to do my customers here to earn money. That's how disinterested people were in Atlanta with natural hair. Now they loved my hair. They would see all the braids and twists and things. And they thought I was in a play or something like, it's beautiful, but why are you wearing your hair like that? Are you getting ready to go on stage or you know, <laughs> you're an actress? Then no, this is just how I wear my hair. You know, it's just natural. So New York was just so far ahead of Atlanta when it came to natural hair. I had made a living just doing nothing but natural hair. And I'm a licensed cosmetologist, but I just chose not to do any of those other styles because I really love natural hair. Like I'm just so intrigued by what it does, what it can do. And I just really enjoyed sharing my knowledge about it. Yeah. That's really interesting. When do you think the tide started to turn in Atlanta? I know exactly when it turned for me. (laughs) So I was working in a very popular salon and I really loved that experience working in, the name of the salon was called Escape. And it was a very popular salon because I was referred to it before I left New York, a lady said, oh, you can move to Atlanta? Check this place out. I've never been in a place like this. Because in New York, you know, we do hair and it's very simple. In Atlanta, it's like a whole production and a show and competitions and all kinds of things like that. And so that's what I saw when I moved to Atlanta. And in that salon, I would sit there all day and no one wanted their hair done. When Janet Jackson and, what is it, Tupac, Poetic Justice, that was the turning point for me. Tell me about how Poetic Justice changed the game for you in Atlanta. Well, before that movie came out, you know, I would be sitting in the salon doing nothing or a customer may come in and that may have talked to about braids. You know, they may ask, but they didn't want to pay, (laughs) you know, so I just knew my time was more valuable just sitting there doing nothing, reading a book or then the slave over here all day for not a fair pay. All of that changed when Poetic Justice came out and Janet Jackson got on that big screen with those big long braids and looking fabulous. That's when my phone started ringing. It started ringing crazy. And I found myself flying to New York less and less <laughs> because I started getting really busy in Atlanta doing hair. So that was early 90s. Did you open your own salon after shortly that? Shortly after that. Yeah, shortly after that. Yeah, I opened the salon. Okay. And... Was it solely natural hair? Yes. Well, when I opened the salon, I was still flying back and forth to New York, not as frequently. I didn't know how Atlanta was. You know, New Yorkers, the natural thing, the Afrocentric, the Jamaican, the cultural Caribbean, it's there. It's embedded there. It's not, it wasn't in Atlanta. So I didn't know if when the movie wasn't as popular, if it was just going to go away. I just didn't know. So I purposely named my salon Braids, Weaves, and Things (laughs) because (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, sister got to eat. So if push comes to shove, I just have to do some weaves because I saw people were wearing weaves and I knew how to do weaves. So that's what it was. But how did you move into products? That experience at Escape Hair Salon, I mean, I just feel so fortunate that I had that experience. It was just so different from what I was used to. It was just a wild and crazy place. But she had two salons. On upstairs, she had about 25 stations. Downstairs, she had about another 17 or something. It was a very huge salon. And so all these different personalities, it was just like a show to me. But one thing I noticed is that everybody that got up from those chairs had a bag, and a bag of Paul Mitchell products, three products, at least two. I was like, wow, that's really good. You know, because that's something I didn't do in my salon in New York. I didn't retail products. And when my clients started asking me, you know, I got busy doing hair and stuff. But when they started asking me, well, what do I put on my hair? What do I do? Because after you get your hair done, you're in this mood. You just want to buy everything for some reason. You want to go to the store and buy stuff and put it in your hair. I don't know what that is, but I do it too. But they were just looking in the mirror and said, what do I put on it? And I really couldn't give them anything. So that's when I really started researching, you know, what are good products out here that I could sell to my customer after I'm done with his or her hair. And I found a line, it's called Kemet Savage. It wasn't for natural hair, but they had some items in there that had no chemicals in it. You know, like the shampoo, the conditioner, and they had the Kemi oil. It was a really popular product called Kemi oil. Came in a little thing, little brown oil. And I started selling that. It was okay. It wasn't what I really needed and what they really needed. So that's really what pushed me because I had the products. I was selling it. I was making money selling, you know, making a little profit, but it just wasn't good for the customer. I just saw that there were missing items. It needed a collection, a full collection that this person can take and go home with and shampoo her hair, condition her hair, style it, maintain it in between the times that she'll come back to me. So that's really what it was. It was a part of just being exposed, exposure, and the need. You identified the need. You tried one thing that didn't work. How did you make your first product and what was it? So the first product was shampoo, conditioner, and a clarifying shampoo because people with locks, I wanted to make sure I had something for them, and a conditioner. Those were the first three. And then quickly, I did a leave-in conditioner, the body fryer. I did a scalp pomade and the foamy mousse and the oil, the healing oil. And those items are still selling today. We have a few of them in that collection that are growth items. So they're still growing. That's amazing. And once you developed the products, did your business sort of shift? Did that start calling you more than doing hair? <laughs> I'm just laughing because at the show this year, we're doing a uh, Talia Wadid experience. And this is walking through everything you're asking me about. <laughs> I'm like, how is she in my head? <laughs> but yes, it did. And I feel so blessed that I can use my left and right side of my brain. You know, I can do the analytical side, the business side. Then I have this very creative side too. But I found that I can't really do both very well together. And that's what I did in the salon for a couple of years. I didn't really recognize that I was struggling with it, you know, until just one day I just said, I just can't keep doing this. Because what would happen is the customers would come in and I would, you know, have an appointment with a customer and then people would come in buying the products, buying the products. I didn't like that because I like service. You know, when I spend money, I want a certain type of feel and I wanted my customers that feel that way too. And I didn't want them to think I was leaving them to go get this over here. And one day I was just in the salon. I said, I can't keep doing this. It's very aggravating. It's frustrating. I have to make some decisions. <laughs> you know, how am I going to fix this here? And that day I just decided, I said, I'm going to make sure these people are really trained in the salon, put somebody behind this counter all the time, and I'm going to go and grow the products. And also looking at the bottom line and looking at the future of each whatever decision. Yeah, I had to weigh it. And it was just much better for the products because I get bored really quickly and I could just find myself being really miserable if I just only did here. So the products gave me an outlet to meet new people, to have more challenges because, okay, so I'm selling them in the salon to my customers. Now I want to sell them to other salons. Then I'm going to want to sell them to stores. You know, as I look back at my life, I see that there's always a progression. There's always a part where... When I start getting comfortable or things start getting 
kind of laxed and I'm like, okay, what can I do now? I'm just always searching to learn more, to be better, to be stressed. I don't know. <laughs> no, I think that you make a really good point. And I understand that as a creative person, you can't be stagnant. Yeah. So you're always looking for something to challenge you, something to spark your creativity, to keep it going. So I understand that. And one of the things is the way that you spend your time. It's creative to do hair, but you're reaching way more people with the product. And also because you're kind of like passively educating them by putting the product out there as well. Exactly. To a larger audience. So I can see that. So you had this vision of going to other salons. Did you know how to do it? Like get other people to sell your product and then get into your first retail store. So getting other salons to sell our products, that was very challenging. And it still is to this day. And it's because of a lack of exposure. But that's what I decided that after just going through some things of trying to do it, that's what it has to be. So I remember when I had my salon in New York, I did not do any retail. Didn't even think about it. It wasn't a thought in my mind. It was just doing hair. I'm a stylist. And when I started selling products to the salons, I would notice that they would buy it one time and then it'll be a long time before they buy it again or something. And at the same time, I was also doing seminars. I was educating stylists on how to incorporate natural hair services into their salons, you know, so they can provide it to their customers. And so I remember one seminar that I had in, I think it was about 80 people in there and we had a display box of the products. And this wasn't part of the class, but I made it a part of the class because I was trying to figure out why stylists are having such a hard time just retailing products. And so I did the math, you know, showed them the profit they would make, the profit margin, gave them a whole guideline of what to do. And I gave them the products for free. I gave away 80 display boxes for free and told them, you take this, do what I asked you to do. Don't put the money in your pocket, do this and that. And only two people re-upped out of 80 people. Wow. Yeah. And I called some of them. I asked them what happened. I just got too busy. And it's another reason why I do the show too, is because I want to educate stylists on doing business, not just doing hair, doing business. Have a cash register, separate your money, you know? So I hope I answered your question because I went all the way around. (laughs) No, no, no. And I think it's really interesting because we don't think about the ways in which that part of the business operates. So if you're a hairstylist, some people just want to do hair or they're so focused on that part of their business that they don't have the bandwidth to incorporate the other stuff and they don't know how to ask for help or who to ask for that help or they don't have the assistants in the salon who can help. So there's a lot there. So this is really helpful because the people who are listening are in this business, they can really think about that as part of their career, that is not just doing hair, that doing hair can be part and parcel of a bigger thing. When did you start getting your product at retail in beauty supply stores and stuff? Well, first I got them into the beauty supply store. That was the first thing. So the local beauty supply stores, I would go around to them and it was a period where they were not interested because 80 and 90% of their business was relaxes. So nobody wants this, you know, basically what they were saying. (laughs) You know, why would we want to litter our shelves with this stuff that's just going to sit here? But at the same time, natural hair was my only way of living. I bought a house and nice cars. There are people out there getting their hair done. I was trying to just explain to them and they just did not get it. They wasn't interested. And eventually... I would find a couple of beauty supply stores that would let me put it in there. Somebody had to give them free product just to show them that people are buying. Oh, yeah, they did buy it. That's a whole different type of business. It's totally separate from doing hair, the way you do business. You know, there's credit, there's terms and all these things. I had to learn all this stuff. I knew nothing about it. One time I finally got to the stage where, okay, I knew, okay, so the stores get it from distributors. So the distributor is the one that's going to buy a lot of it and sell to the stores. So he'll buy a lot from me. So I have to go to all these little stores. So I figured that out. And I had gone to one distributor. Actually, he was the biggest distributor here at the time. And I didn't know because I didn't know the business. So I went and they bought the products in 
And he wanted to get a booth at my show too at the time. And so I said, okay, got the booth. And he bought some of my products on credit, of course. And I asked him, I think I was checking the books or something. And I saw that he didn't pay for his booth. And I called him. I said, well, you know, you didn't pay for your booth, whatever. He says, oh, well, I'll pay you in 30 days. I'm like, 30 days? The show is over. (laughs) I need to get paid now. (laughs) Because I didn't understand. There's a totally different way of doing business. Boy, that was really something. And we kind of got into it a little bit. And he tried to blackball me. And so I just remember being just sad and depressed about that because the whole situation, I didn't analyze it first. I just went in. I didn't understand it was a different way of doing business. But anyway, I just decided, you know what? He's not the only distributor. I just have to find the other ones. (laughs) And I did exactly that. And I sold to all of them. And guess what happened? He called me (laughs) and said, well... Why am I not having your new kids line? I said, well, you said you would never, ever buy from me again. You know, so that's how I got the products into the stores. There's the one level is you could walk into the beauty supply stores. The next level is selling to distributors. And then after distributors, you know, then you want your products in the big boxes, you know, the big box stores, the Walmarts, the Targets, the things like that, which is a whole nother monster. But it's possible you can get it done. And the big boxes require you to go in and present. Sometimes it does. Sometimes you have a sales rep that goes and presents for you because they may have a better relationship. They may be able to make things happen a little quicker than you going in. But things have changed now, so they may be doing it more where you can just go right in. But I would definitely seek advice and counsel because these are big businesses and they are there only to do business, only for profit. So you just got to go protect yourself and protect your profit margin. You know, when you go into these big stores like that and don't sign anything. (laughs) Unless you talk to an attorney. I was very fortunate that I had a mentor. I looked for a mentor because I know that I don't know everything, you know, especially after that situation there, you know, it turned out to be good for me. But still, I think that was a sign for me, the really confirmation that you need to find out how to do this business. You've been doing that business. You need to learn how to do this business. And I'm just dummy down and just took in the knowledge. And that was very helpful. I didn't make a lot of mistakes because of that. That's some great advice in terms of finding someone and admitting you don't know what you don't know. I mean, we all can't know everything. So I think it's really important. And you save yourself. And also understanding that retail itself is a whole nother animal. Just understanding the terms involved with getting product there and what your responsibility in that process is as a vendor is different than you might think. You might think that they're going to help you, but they just expect you to send their product to them. They're not going to give you any help in that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be really turning out some big, huge profits automatically in order for you to get any kind of assistance. And that assistance is because you are feeding that bottom line of theirs. If you're not doing that, you can just forget about it. And it takes a lot more money to do business in big box and you get less profit. So that the idea or the goal for that is to get as much distribution as you can. Right. So that you can find your customer wherever they are, because we know that Black women do really shop at Beauty Supply. Oh, yes, we do. That's an important part of our beauty experience. But there are people who live in places that don't have beauty supply. So that's why Big Box works. And for that instance, that you're also reaching them. They might have to drive far to get them. So having a product in those Big Box retailers helps. Now, how big is the line now? You have more than one line now. Tell us how many lines and what they are. And then how many SKUs in total you have. How many lines? We have Uncle Jimmy's products is my men's collection. And there are about nine SKUs in that collection. You know, anywhere from body wash to lotions to hair products, hair conditioners, hair shampoos, oil, beard softeners, those kind of items in there. And then we have the Black Earth line, which is the original. And we have the Curls, Waves, and Naturals, which has the famous Curly Curl Cream in there. That's our number one selling item. And then we have the Protective Styles, 
which is for women that wear protective styles, you know, to keep your hair healthy underneath. Our slogan is show your real hair some love. <laughs> and then we have Apple and Aloe, which is our latest collection, which you probably see in stores. No, I just happen to have a jar right here. <laughs> so that's how it looks. <laughs> that's our Apple and Aloe collection there. And we have a children's line too, Kinky Wavy Natural. All, so you went from your first collection to all of these collections and from selling in your salon to selling across the country. Are you also in the Caribbean? And internationally, yes. We sold in Africa. Internationally, yeah. That's another learning curve, international. But let's start talking about the show, the World Natural Hair Show. How'd you get this idea? And then walk me through how you put the first one together. I was very inspired by the Bronner Brothers show. So when I left New York, I was dead broke. <laughs> and I borrowed $900 from my dad because I heard the Brown and Brothers show was coming up. And I had gone to one when I lived in New York a couple of years before, and I was just, it was very exciting. And so I said, you know, wow, let me just get a booth there. And so I got a booth at the Brown and Brothers show and did hair, got me some models, borrowed clothes from the mall, <laughs> did their hair and paraded them all up and down the Brown and Brothers show. And it wasn't at that time, but I would have to say that exposure a couple of years later, I, you know, just in my mind that, wow, I want to do a show like this, but I don't want any relaxers. I don't want any chemicals. I want it to be all natural. So I wonder how that will go. <laughs> and I did it. The first show, how did you get other people to participate? Like other vendors? And you also had competitors there. How did you sell them on the idea? There were really no natural hair products of people that were saying we sell natural hair. So I told them, because they would say, well, why do you want us to come? We have relaxers. I said, because you have shampoos, you have conditioners. And right now, you know, that's what natural women are looking for. Good shampoos, good conditioners, good moisturizers. I said, you just can't bring the relaxers. That's pretty much how I convinced the very few that came to come. And the first couple of times, it wasn't even any hair care products. We were the only ones there. But to sell the guys the next time, I took pictures and showed them, you know, see, people are buying our stuff. You know, look at all the people around our booth. And they think, oh, okay, that's interesting. You know, then they start asking questions and, you know, convince them to come. Some of them I had to, like, give them a real deep discount just to get them to come and see what it was. As far as the attendees, there was, I guess you could say, like, a cultural community here in Atlanta that was kind of coming up in the West End. And they were the ones that came to the show. I remember being at the Georgia International Convention Center. That's where we do the show still. And there was a lady there. I get it every time I see her. She's still there. She had a perm, permed out here. And she would just turn her nose up at us like, I don't even know why y'all doing this. You know what? Uh, okay. You're going to do that? Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, they got drums? Oh, is it? You know, she was just so just not connected, just like, ah. Uh. I wish y'all hurry up and leave because I don't even know what y'all are doing. <laughs> but now she has locks <laughs> and just totally changed, you know. And I said, well, what happened, Andrea? What happened? She said, well, you know, just, I just saw it over the years. It evolved, you know, it wasn't just Afrocentric people that just wanted to beat drums and do whatever. I say it wasn't never even that. It was more to it than what you saw. She said, yeah, I noticed that when once I started walking around in the hall a little more, I even started talking to people. And she watched the show evolve from just having a certain demographic of people to having more mainstream people. And it's kind of weird saying that, but that's really what it was. It was you had people that wanted to be corporate because that's what you were told you need to be. You need to fit inside box and be corporate. Anything outside of here, you're trying to be too black. You're trying to do uh, at Black Power. No, you're a rebel. And I don't want to associate myself with that because I'm doing better because I'm doing this over here just the way they told me to do it. So that's what I'm going to do. Y'all do that. But she saw after a while, this is what the people over there that's in that box, they really wanted to come out of that box and they wanted to be over here with us just like she did when she would walk around in the hall. I'm like, why you keep coming in here? <laughs> and we would just crack up. I would just tease her all the time. She's like, oh, what y'all doing? But yeah, it was exciting to me to watch her evolve. And I know that my show has done that for hundreds, if not thousands of other women. 
too. And you said some really powerful things there. The impact of respectability politics. There have been generations of people who have been conditioned, just as you said earlier about go to college. This is the path. This is the only way that we consider successful. So that's respectability politics. Another way it had shown up at that time, particularly our hair, how we wore it. We are put in a box based on our hairstyles. And that's why the Crown Act is so important. But we were so heavily influenced by respectability politics that we believed it. A lot of people believed these things. And so they follow like sheep, like, oh, God, we got to do this. This is the way we have to be. And then we go home and we're who we are authentically. But sometimes you can't even go home and be authentic, though, because your family. I've heard horror stories when I used to do my clients here when they were trying to go natural and transition. One lady told me that she went to see a grandmother on her dying bed. And she asked her, why are you coming here with your hair nappy like that? Your grandbaby came to see you. All you see is her coming with nappy hair and you're embarrassed, but you're on your way out. It was just really deep. I heard a lot of stories. Yeah, that kind of runs deep. Those feelings about respectability and what success looks like and respectability, it impacts us in lots of ways. It does. When did you see the shift? Because now thousands of people come to your show. Mm -hmm. When did you see it like explode or was it a gradual build? Oh my God, it was so gradual. It was painfully gradual. I would come to the show, you know, some years, remember a week before just biting my things, just I hope more people come. I hope more people come and more people did not come. (laughs) It's just... Yeah, I remember one show, I just bust out crying because I was just so devastated that, wow, there's people that want to do this. You know, where are they? Why aren't they coming out to celebrate this? And as the show grew, as I started seeing different kinds of people come in, I had to tailor the show. I had to balance making everybody comfortable. Let me phrase this differently. Do you think the show grew as women became more interested in natural hair, all different kinds of women? And so they started coming as well? Yes, I would say that. As natural hair became more popular, more people started coming to the show. But before it got popular on social media, it was just a struggle. It was just a real struggle. Right. You were doing this way before social media. Yes, way before social media. Yeah, so it was word of mouth. Word of mouth. I mean, this show was still growing, growing every year, but it just wasn't going the way I believed that it should be growing based on what I know people wanted. I know that people, you know, they started wanting natural hair more. They just needed the information. They needed to come and see all the different hairstyles that are available, the products that you can use. So yeah, I would say it was a slow grow. But I do remember one year that it was when it just popped that one year I was coming up Camp Creek Parkway, where the, the big street that the show is on. And I was just complaining, all oh, these doggone cars. I'm, I'm late. God, dog, what's this? Why? It's all, it's because I started looking around, seeing in the cars, natural hair. And they were all going towards it. I said, they're going to the show. <laughs> yes, that was the year that it just popped. What made you stick with it, even when you weren't satisfied with where it was growing at the beginning? Because I really believe people were going to get it one day. They were going to get it one day. As long as I've been doing it in New York, in New York, it's just always been there. If I were to do that show in New York, it would have been packed. So I just believe that it was just going to take time. It's just going to take a little more time, a little more money, <laughs> a little more dedication. It was my money. I didn't have any sponsors. I really find it interesting. So once social media came and it started popping you shifted just the content of the show because you saw a different consumer coming through. Mm-hmm. That's what I did. I started seeking out different kinds of vendors that I knew they would be attracted to. The different demographics would be attracted to. Right. What do you love most about doing this show? Man, there's so many things that I love about this show. I love that I created a product that helps people. It's not just a show to come and buy products and party. We purposely have workshops that offer information to benefit family, yourself, uh, finance, you know, healthy living, healthy eating, 
it just has a lot of benefit. And that's what I really love most about the show. I met so many people that have come to the show and they say it's changed their life in a positive way. They were eating one way and the things that they've learned, now they chose to eat differently. Well, back then they were relaxing their hair and now they aren't. Now it's just healthy eating. I learned what kind of loan I need to get for my business. I learned that I can get health insurance. I need a will, those kind of things. And plus it's just a lot of fun. And the show has been going on for so long that now we're in another generation. We have like babies. They were babies, but now they're grown and they're having babies. It's a family thing. And there's a lady that comes from Paris and she's pregnant. Every year she comes. I don't know if she's going to be pregnant this year again. <laughs> I, I, like watch, I like seeing her because <laughs> she comes all the way from Paris pregnant, <laughs> you know, so she loves the show. And then it's another lady that lives in Alabama who met her husband at the show. They were dating for a couple of years. Every year I would see them. And then the family started popping out. The little baby here. The next year you got two babies. Next year now you got another one. So it's just so much that I like about it. I love about it. Now that there are other natural hairlines, once there started being natural hairlines, was it hard to convince the competitors to come to the show to participate in it? No, mm -mm. it's a watering hole. You got to be there. If you have natural hair care products or you're trying to reach that consumer, you're trying to get your products in the stores <laughs> because the retailers, they all come to the show. So you have to be there, really. It's smart for you to be there. It's like the one weekend of the year that you know, open the doors and everybody comes in. and We just all have a great time because I believe in cooperation. So we can compete and cooperate. That's what we need to do better at because we will be a lot further. We can help each other a lot more. I love that. Cooperation. Yeah, cooperation. That's what I believe in. And I just wish a lot of us would buy into that too because we are so resourceful and we have so much that we can share with each other and help each other. That's great. Now, you were the first and now, you know, there have been some other shows that have come up, some younger people. You said we just talked about cooperation. What that means for natural hair? What do you think that means for just the growth of natural hair and the interest in natural hair? I think it's going to make it stronger, make it stay around longer because you have younger people coming with their ideas and the way that they see things and the way they want to do things. And yeah, I think it's not going anywhere. It'll never go back to the way it was where we were relaxing out here. Parents were making you get a relax at five and seven and all those kind of things. It'll never go back to that. I really don't think it will. But I do think it's important for us to start having those conversations about relaxes because I was doing my granddaughters here the other day and they all have such beautiful hair. And I said, don't ever put a perm or relax in your hair. She's like, what's that? <laughs> That's a mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> And you had mentioned in the pre-interview that now there are like lots of generations of people that grew up and never had a relaxer. Never had a relaxer. And they have no need for one. They just like, why would I do that to my hair? Like, huh? And the one girl and it can't get curly again? I said, no, you have to cut it all off. Oh, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and I remember my mother would not allow me to get a relaxer. I begged her and begged her for one. She said, no, it's no way in the world you're going to get a relaxer. And so I was forced to learn how to do my own hair. And that's when I really started understanding what my hair does. I know my hand like the back of my hand. And I just fell in love with it. But I had never had a relaxer and everyone else had one. So I still wanted one. <laughs> so when I got old enough, I got one. And I just absolutely hated it because... My big volume, I didn't have that volume. My hair didn't feel alive anymore. It was just like that. And I couldn't wait to get new growth so it could have that poof. So I let it grow out, but I tried it. <laughs> so you know, so you know, you can speak from experience. Yeah, I speak from experience. Yeah. Let's talk about the show. We have a show upcoming at the end of April, 2022. How do people get tickets? So you go to naturalhairshow.org, but follow us at Natural Hair Show. And yeah, the tickets are there. It's the website. All the information on all the activities that are going on on the weekend are going to be there at naturalhairshow.org. And it is a great event, two-day event, and over 300 vendors and normally over 30,000 people. This is the first time that we're coming back since COVID. Right. I was going to ask you, how did COVID impact what you do in terms of the platform, World Natural Hair Show? The show had to stop 
for two years, we did not do the show. Fortunately, the products did not stop. So we kept selling the products. Our online business grew. And that's taliawajidbrand.com or naturalhair.org. You can purchase the products there. And yeah, we shut down the warehouse for a couple of months, but everything still kind of flowed. We were very fortunate, very blessed. But the show did stop. Well, because you didn't want to have 30,000 people in the space then. We didn't want to have two people in our face. (laughs) (laughs) Very true. As we close, if you could give our listeners like, five tips on how you look at competition, because you already talked about cooperation. Instead of fearing versus the power of collaboration. Well, you just shouldn't embrace fear about anything. You know, it's okay to be alerted and alarmed, but fearful, no. I strongly believe that everybody's journey is different. So when it comes to competitors, you look, but you don't stare. You have to see what's going on around you, but don't waste your time staring because you don't know what's going on behind those doors. So just focus on what you're doing, what your goals are and how you want to grow your business and where you want to be. Envision yourself there and don't look at the competition so much. That's what I would say about that. That's a great word right there. Can you give us a tip on the power of collaboration? Yeah, the power of collaboration... And honestly, (laughs) I would love to have more stories to tell about collaboration. Since I've been in the business, I've really, just what I said, I keep my head down looking at what I'm doing and how can I grow my business. But when I see an opportunity to create a collaborative situation, I'm very excited about that because this is Black people. I just feel like we just need to do it more. We need to collaborate more. So what if we're selling the same kind of products? I mean, there's so many competitive products. You go in the store in one lane, everybody's competing with each other. The customer decides. So you do your best job to get the customer to choose you. But when you're not doing that, I don't see any problem with doing some things collectively. Of course, I'm not saying sit there and tell each other you know, your secrets. Or, but I think it should be normal. I really think it should be. I think we should be more welcoming to each other. And especially to the new people that come up. That's just what I believe. Yeah, I think there is really value in what you're saying about that because everyone brings their own special sauce to whatever they do. I mean, you can have the same idea and it can come off differently by two different people. But also, I'd love you to just give me a tip on why people should consider uh, mentors. Because it just saves a lot of time. It saves a lot of heartache. <laughs> And having a mentor doesn't mean that they're going to tell you everything to do. That's not a mentor. A mentor will let you make mistakes. They'll let you trip, but they're not going to let you like really fall and break too much stuff. And if it's a good mentor, then you'll feel it. They'll give you a chance to make decisions based on the things that you've talked about before. And if you're being a good mentee, then while you're a mentor, you're supposed to be collecting tools. That means close your mouth and listen. I've had a hard time finding someone to mentor because people will ask me to mentor them and then they tell me everything they want to do. They don't want to hear nothing I have to say. And I don't know what that is because I know when I was a mentee, I know nothing because you have done it. You have the experience. So I need you to share with me and help guide me as I work through things I can have you to come to and bounce things off of. It's just important to have that person because if you don't have someone that knows more than you do, that has already gone through the challenges and made some of the mistakes, they can help you avoid making them. And you're always learning. You're always learning when you're talking to someone that has experience. And a tip is when you're with your mentor, just shut it down and listen. Even if they're saying something that you already know, they may say one word different. (laughs) Just listen. (laughs) Absolutely. I just want to ask you this as a final question. What's your hope for natural hair in the future? Well, some of my hope has come true that it's normalized. (laughs) It's not a costume looked at as a costume or a reason for wearing. It's just normal. I'm a grandmother. And so my youngest granddaughter, she didn't do that child's hair at all. She would shampoo it, throw some conditioner on, and it's just wild all over the place. And the baby was just as happy. And I remember when I had her and it was just, oh, you got to do the baby's hair. You got to conform it and keep it all neat and stuff. This is the freedom, just the freedom of having 
natural hair, making that normal. As long as it's clean and it's moisturized and healthy, it should be normal. And so my wish and my hopes is that it just continues forever or gets better. And more and more people are just accepted. And I see that. I see it happening. I remember my mom is one of those people too that she didn't want me to get a relaxer. She didn't wear a relaxer, but it was the locks that my brothers had. And she just could not understand why would you wear your hair like that? Okay. God bless her soul. But she passed away and she had locks for the last probably, before she left, probably 25 years. <laughs> so, and that's just exposure. It's just exposure and being open minded. So, yeah. I love the fact that your mom finally understood why and that she too got to see it. And she got to see your success as well. Mm -hmm. She did. Again, the World Natural Hair Show is April 22nd and 23rd. Yes, get your tickets. And you go to naturalhairshow.org to get your tickets. And follow Talia Wajid at Talia Wajid Brand. And thanks again, Talia, for being with me today. I'm really excited. We wish you all the best on the show and this new line. That sounds really intriguing. Oh, yes, it is. And thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Start Right Here podcast. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate, or review our show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or share it with a friend. Remember, there is more than one way to the top, but all that is required is for you to take the first step. So we invite you to start right here. Remember to check out our newsletter, The Last Word from Start Right Here. On it, we offer additional information on taking a seat at the table or building one when it comes to beauty and inclusion. You can go to thebeautytable.substack.com or check the link in the show notes.